Abrahamim, Father of mercies, we worship you, Lord. We thank you for your Shabbat. We thank you for this time together as Mishpacha to worship before you. Lord, I pray that as we open up your word today, as we dig into the Parsha, that you will speak boldly into our hearts and our lives, that you will open up our minds to understand what you are, are uh, relaying to us, that you will speak through me and that nothing of me will be involved except that which you have ordained specifically for this purpose. B'Shem Yeshua Meshachinu. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray. And everyone says, Amen. I forget to actually have my notes up. So as uh, most of you know already, I am currently psychotic enough that I don't have enough in my life going on that I'm working on a master's program. Uh, so I'm, I'm working with the, uh, the King's University and their Messianic Jewish Studies program on a uh, master's of divinity in Messianic Jewish Studies um, with the potential of possibly moving into a doctoral program afterwards that one's you know we'll see how i survive this but uh and then as if that isn't crazy enough our kids are homeschooled and then in the fall danielle will start back to school also so life will be interesting but while i love to learn and i love to read i love to uh to write and have never really been uh, a huge fan personally of of any of that in the context of school when i graduated high school i had zero intentions of ever going to college whatsoever um, and here i am uh years later with a bachelor's degree working towards a master's and and again potentially targeting a doctoral program afterwards and ultimately my hope is and goal is to teach on the academic level level, um, and then to play on the suffering of other people going through collegiate classes. So, but, uh, but even though I am uh, in grad school and pushing 40, there is no greater feeling than when I submit the final assignment for the semester, and I know freedom is in sight. Sorry, Olivia, I know you got no hopes of that anytime soon, but um, I just wrapped up my spring semester about two weeks ago. My kids, who are both homeschooled, have just finished their school year, and currently everyone around us is focusing on the closing out of the 2021-2022 school year. And here's the thing, I don't care how much uh, I have enjoyed the content of the classes or how much I've taken away from any of them or anything along those lines. When spring semester ends and I have turned in my final assignments, there's just something so freeing, so exciting, so refreshing, knowing I'm entering that illustrious summer vacation mindset. Two months or so of no deadlines, no assignments, no discussion posts, no syllabi, no lectures. If I want to read, it's because I you know, actually want to read. If I want to write, it's because I actually want to write. But even at my age, I get so excited at the promise of freedom that the end of the school year brings. It's almost a euphoric feeling. Do you, you know, you can imagine kind of that feeling. Most of you, at least at some point in time, were in school. Uh, some of you are still in school. Some of you will never stop being in school. Um, whether you're still in school or not, uh, we likely all remember the hope and the joy that comes with knowing summer break is here and the feeling of freedom that comes with it. Have we ever actually taken the time to think about this idea, though, of freedom, especially like in the context of being done with something and being able to walk away from it, uh, whether for a season or long term? Have we ever thought about this concept of freedom in spiritual terms? Because as exhilarating as it is, when freedom from classes and summer break comes, it is nothing compared to the spiritual reality of freedom that Yeshua has provided for us. This week we read Parsha Behar from Leviticus 25, 1 through 26, 2. And the Parsha is focused entirely on the Shemitah, which would occur every seven years, and the Yovel, which would occur every 50 years. In the beginning of Leviticus 25, we see the Lord tell Moses to speak to Israel that they are to begin the counting of the Shemitah and the Yovel cycle upon entering into Israel, into the land of Israel, the promised land. Adonai commands that for six years, the land is to be worked and harvested and on the seventh year, the land is to have a Shabbat rest to Adonai. In the Shemitah year, Ben Israel is not to work the land at all, and whatever it produces on its own will be food for Ben Israel, the, their servants, the outsiders dwelling within with them, and even their livestock and their animals. The Shemitah would be a year of complete reliance on Hashem while allowing his holy uh, land to rest 
and to be recuperated. Likewise, the Yovel, or the Jubilee year, as uh, it's often worded in, uh, in English, and especially around here, everybody knows that terminology, Jubilee, although the, the context is entirely different. But um, the, the Yovel is also reliant on our ability to count. And I know it's weird that God wants us to count so much, right? But it's reliant on our ability to count, just like with Shavuot, in which we are commanded to count the Omer for 49 days. And on the 50th day, we are to celebrate Shavuot. For the Yovel, we are to count 49 years, or seven Shemitah cycles. Then on the 50th year, on Yom Kippur, proclaim the Yovel, and all territory is to return to its tribal possession, and all in servitude are set free. Both the Shemitah and the Yovel are to be held holy, and are Moedim, or appointed days of Adonai, just like the Shabbat, Pesach, Shavuot, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. As we look at Parsha Behar today, I want us to focus on one of the most important aspects, in my opinion, of this Parsha. And as we do, I want us to keep this principle in mind. We have been freed from slavery to sin and death, and have been made new as servants of Adonai. So let's walk boldly in our freedom in Messiah. To repeat that one more time, we have been freed from slavery to sin and death and have been made new as servants of Adonai. So let's walk boldly in our freedom in Messiah. Let's dig into the text a little bit today together, if you would. Leviticus 25, 1 through 13. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to them. If you don't have your Bibles, it's okay. We, we plan for uh, that probability, and these readings will be on the screens as well. But it says, uh, verse 1, Then Adonai said to Moses on Mount Sinai, Speak to B'nai Israel and tell them when you come into the land which I give you, then the land is to keep a Shabbat to Adonai. For six years you are to sow your field, and for six years you may prune your vineyard, and gather in its fruit. But in the seventh year, there is to be a Shabbat rest for the land, a Shabbat to Adonai. You are not to sow your field or prune your vineyard. You are not to reap uh, what grows by itself during your harvest, nor gather the grapes of your, of your untended vines. It is to be a year of Shabbat rest for the land. Whatever the Shabbat of the land produces will be food for yourselves, your servant, for your maid servant, for your hired worker, and for the outsider dwelling among you. Even for your livestock and for the animals that are in your land, all its increase will be enough food. You are to count off seven Shabbatot of years, seven times seven years, so that the time is seven Shabbatot of years, 49 years. Then on the 10th day of the seventh month on Yom Kippur, you are to Sound a shofar blast. You are to sound the shofar all throughout your land. You are to make the 50th year holy and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all the inhabitants. It is to be a jubilee to you when each of you is to return to his own property and each of you to return to his family. That 50th year will be your jubilee. You are not to sow your, uh, or reap that which grows by itself or gather from untended vines. Since it is a jubilee, it is to be holy to you. You will eat from the increase out of the field. And this year of jubilee, each of you will return to his property. See, the Lord specifically commands the land to rest during the Shemitah, and more so calls, uh, calls it a Shabbat year for the land. This means that the Shemitah year is just as important to, for Israel's observance and obedience as is the weekly Shabbat itself or any of the other Moedim, whether it's Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Pesach, what have you. Yet we, uh, we know that Israel failed to actually honor the Shemitah year as required by Torah for some 490 years after coming into the land. Jeremiah proph uh, prophesied 70 years of captivity for B'nai Israel in Babylon to allow Ebed Israel, the land of Israel, the 70 years of Shemitah rest, it was not given by B'nai Israel. And we see Jeremiah's prophecy actually fulfilled in 2 Chronicles 36, beginning with verse 15. It says, Adonai, the God of their fathers, sent word to them through his messengers again and again because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers 
messengers of God and despised the words and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of Adonai rose against his people, until there was no remedy. Therefore he brought up against them the king of the Chaldeans who killed their young men with the sword in the house of their temple. He had no pity on young men or virgins, uh, elderly or informed. He gave them all into his hand. All the vessels of the house of God, large and small, and the treasuries of the house of Adonai, as well as the treasuries of the king and of his, uh, and his officers, were all brought to Babylon. They burned the house of God, broke down the wall of Jerusalem, turned, uh, burned all the palaces with fire, and destroyed everything of value. He exiled to Babylon those who had escaped the sword, and they became slaves to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. In fulfillment of the word of Adonai, by the, hand, by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had paid back her Shabbat rests. For as long as it lay desolate, the Shabbat rest was kept till 70 years were complete. But the Shemitah and the Yovel go hand in hand together. The Shemitah is not only a year of rest or a sabbatical for the land, it is also a year of freedom for those indentured. In fact, we read in Exodus 21 that when an Israelite sells themselves for uh, servitude, they are to work for six years, and then on the seventh, which is the Shemitah, to be set free. Exodus 21 continues on to say if the servant decides he doesn't want to go free because he loves his master so much, then in all is to be pierced through his ear and he will remain with his master. But the Shemitah is also the counting mechanism necessary to bring us to the proclamation of the Yovel, of the year of Jubilee, which is an even greater year of freedom and release. In the Yovel, all ancestral land uh, that has been sold is to be returned to the tribe to whom it belongs. Along with that, all Israelites who have fallen upon hard financial times and had to become indentured servants to other Israelites are to be set completely free on the Yovel. This even includes those who choose to stay on with their masters at the Shemitah and have had an awe pierced through their ear. Uh, all Israelites are to go free. All Israelite land is to be released back to its ancestral inheritance. And the Yovel is super important, not just because it is a year of freedom and restoration, but because, uh, all, uh, because all pricing and negotiation of land sell in Eretz Israel, which because of the divine instruction of the Yovel is really more like a lease than an actual deed sell, um, it's based off of how far away the next Yovel is. In other words, if you find yourself in a difficult spot financially and have to sell your land to another Israelite, you can only charge him for the land a fair a value fair to the number of harvest he can actually work the land because ultimately that land is coming back to you or to your tribe at the next Yovel. In fact, Adonai specifically says in Leviticus 25, verse 23, Moreover, the land is not to be sold uh, permanently because the land is mine. For you are sojourners with me. For any land you possess, you are to provide for redemption of the land. Now, verse 23 is extremely important, and, and especially that last sentence. Let's take a look at these two verses one more time. Moreover, the land is not to be sold permanently. Why? Because the land is mine, for you are sojourners with me. For any land you possess, you are to provide for redemption of the land. One of the biggest aspects of the purpose of the Shemitah and the Yovel are that they serve as a reminder to Israel for all our days that we are Gerim Ve Toshavim. We are sojourners and settlers in the promised land. The most important aspect of why God is bringing Israel into the promised land is because it is his promised land. It is the land in which he has chosen to have his presence reside among his creation. Israel's security in the promised land comes from from residing in God's presence in God's land. We must never forget that we were set free from slavery in Egypt so that we could live in the presence of God, so that we could take up sanctuary in his midst. So if we are to remain in the promised land, we are to do so vigilantly remaining in the presence of God, putting every ounce of energy and attention that we have into staying in the presence of God. In order to do that, we must remain faithful to his word, faithful to observe and obey all that has, he has spoken in his Torah. 
And another way to look at this in order to keep things in perspective is that Israel was set free from slavery in Egypt to uh, become bond servants of Adonai. So God calls us not to take advantage of one another, not to treat those who are financially downtrodden in our midst as though they are of less value. In fact, even when an Israelite sells himself to another Israelite, they are to be treated with respect and dignity. They are not to be treated as property, but rather as a member of the family, more so as the child of the one whom they are now serving. Why? Because we were redeemed from slavery in Egypt to be made bond servants of Adonai. And this is exactly how he treats us, as his own sons and daughters. And we are all equal in his eyes. No one is lesser or more important. Leviticus 25 verse 55 says, For Bnei Israel are my servants, my servants whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. I am Adonai, your God. Why is no portion of the promised land to be sold in perpetuity? Because it is Hashem's, and we are Gerim Vetoshavim, sojourners and settlers with him. And why is no Israelite to be sold to another in perpetuity? Because B'nai Israel are, are Hashem's, and we were brought, brought out of the land of Egypt to be his servants and for him to be our God. Now, this is an important concept, and I want us to, to make sure we grasp it carefully and completely. We are Adonai's servants, whether in Eretz Israel and the land of Israel are scattered in the diaspora. We are sojourners with Adonai. As followers of Messiah, both Jew and Gentile alike, this concept becomes all the more important and comes to a greater clarity with regards to the greater spiritual concept Adonai was trying to reveal through Moses to Israel in the Torah. Again, our principle, we have been freed from slavery to sin and death and have been made new as servants of Adonai. So let's walk boldly in our freedom in Messiah. Let's take a closer look at Yeshua's own words in his home synagogue in Nazareth, which was read in our Torah service this morning, as he returns from being filled with the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, when immersed by Yochanan Hadmat Bill, John the Immerser, and after fasting and being tempted by the adversary in the wilderness for 40 days. He returns to his home synagogue and is called to make Aliyah and read from the Sefer, from Sefer Yeshayahu, or from the, the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. In Luke 4, we read these words. Yeshua returned in the power of the Ruach to the Galilee, and news about him went out through all the surrounding region. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone was praising him. And he came to Nazareth, to Nazareth, where he had been raised. As was his custom, he went into the synagogue on Shabbat, and he got up to read. When the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written, the Ruach Adonai, the Spirit of God, is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed and to proclaim the year of Adonai's favor. He closed the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. All eyes in the synagogue were focused on him. As Yeshua comes back from the wilderness and officially begins his ministry, he kicks things off by unapologetically announcing what the first coming of Mashiach was all about. He reads from Isaiah, the Ruach Adonai, the Spirit of God is on, upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed and to proclaim the year of Adonai's favor. Yeshua announces that he has come to declare a spiritual yovel, a spiritual jubilee. And with exception of sight to the blind, each and everything Yeshua declares here is in direct connection to Parsha Behar and the imagery of freedom and redemption found in the Shemitah and the yovel. Good news to the poor, release to the captive, set free the oppressed, proclaim the year of Adonai's favor. Then with every eye focused on him, Yeshua tells all in attendance, verse 21 of Luke 4. Then he began to tell them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your ears. The entire ministry of Yeshua from his immersion by Yochanan HaMabil, by John the Immerser, to his death on the cross, to his resurrection and ultimate ascension into the Alam Haba, into the world to come, to the empowering and dwelling of the Ruach HaKodesh has been for the distinct purpose of proclaiming good news to the poor, setting free those in captivity and bondage. And what is this good news? 
that there is now access to eternal life in the name of Yeshua. There is now freedom from the bondage of slavery to sin and the blood of Yeshua. And there is now power to walk in righteousness because of the indwelling of the Ruach HaKodesh, of his Holy Spirit. Much like the first Passover when God set Israel free from slavery in Egypt, we have been set free from the bondage of sin. And why? Leviticus 25, 55 again. For B'nai Israel are my servants, my servants whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. I am Adonai, your God. And our principle one more time. We have been freed from slavery to sin and death and have been made new servants, uh, made new as servants of Adonai. So let's walk boldly in our freedom in Messiah. And the Torah Parsha based devotional book, Walk Leviticus, and there's a whole series, Walk Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, uh, by Dr. Jeffrey Feinberg. Uh, he paraphrases Rashi's take on Parsha Behar and the reality that a time might come where an Israelite might have to sell his property and himself to, in, in order to survive. The progression to this point isn't a spontaneous reality. It is a compounding problem that leaves the person in detriment. Rashi notes, the descendant spir the, the descent spirals from loss of movable property such as livestock to the forced sell of ancestral lands, loss of one's house, debt, servanthood, and selling of oneself to other Israelites or to non a non Jew whose family serves idols. An Israelite must be impoverished completely before Torah permits him to sell his ancestral lands. And in the same sense, one doesn't fall into the destitute regards to, with sin uh, in one clean swoop. It is a process that spirals from one poor decision to another till ultimately we find ourselves trapped in bondage to the ways of this world and to the adversary. But in Messiah Yeshua, we have been free. We have freedom available to us. He has come to break the chains that keep us bound to our mistakes, our poor decisions, our misjudgments, our wrong, uh, wronging other people, and anything else that's holding us down or holding us back from the reality of the promise that God has given us. In the same sense that uh, an Israelite might find themselves in a situation where they may need to sell ancestral land or be a bond servant to another Israelite, yet on the Shemitah, and no matter what ultimately in the Yovel, they would be set free and restored completely. We have all fallen short of the glory of God, and we have all found ourselves in bad situations and poor decisions leading to worse and worse. Yet Yeshua offered his life that we could be made free, that we could be restored and renewed completely. But Leviticus 25, 5, uh, 55 is the catch to our freedom. Again, for B'nai Israel are my servants, my servants whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. I am Adonai. I am your God, Adonai, your God. We were made free from slavery in Egypt, and we are made free from slavery to sin and the enemy in order to be faithful servants of Adonai Eloheinu. Paul says in Romans 6, verses 16 through 18, do you not know that to whatever you yield yourselves as slaves for obedience, you are slaves to what you obey, whether to sin uh, resulting in death or to obedience resulting in, lost myself, I'm sorry. Whether to death result to sin resulting in death or to obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching under which you were placed. And after you were set free from sin, you became enslaved to righteousness. And he continues this thought with verse 22. Uh, Romans 6 verse 22 says, But now having been set free from sin and having become enslaved to God, you have your, you have, uh, your fruit resulting in holiness and the outcome is eternal life. For sin's payment is death, but God's gracious gift is eternal life in Messiah Yeshua our Lord. When we find freedom and salvation in Messiah Yeshua, we are trading slavery to this world, slavery to the enemy, slavery to sin and death for slavery to righteousness, slavery to Messiah Yeshua, slavery to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And may we cleave to the truth of our salvation, redemption, and restoration, the joy of our freedom from sin and bond service to the kingdom of Messiah. 
We have been freed from slavery to sin and death and have been made new as servants of Adonai. Let's walk boldly in our freedom and Messiah. Have you experienced true freedom and Messiah, Yeshua? And I'm not talking about, you know, the, this idea of freedom that we can do whatever we want. Freedom that we can, we can get away with anything because we've been redeemed, we've been restored, we've said a repeat after me prayer. There's, there's no more action required. You know, we have this mindset in the body of Messiah today that there's this disconnect where we think that because we are free in Messiah, that that means that we no longer have obligation to be obedient. Or, or even worse, I think the, the, the other way around on the thought process is that because we no longer have to try to earn our salvation, that that means we don't have to try to be righteous anymore. But the reality is, is the word of God calls us to be faithful no matter what. And when I talk about freedom, I'm talking about true unbridled freedom in Messiah. This concept is far different than what the world around us uh, experiences. And maybe even some in the body of Messiah would, would like to think to be different as well because Yeshua has not provided us salvation, washed clean our sins and broken the chains of the enemy in your life so that you can be, continue to walk in sin and enslavement to the world around you. He hasn't made freedom available to you so that you can become one thing when you're in your congregation and a whole other thing when you're in the world with your friends. He has broken the chains of bondage. The enemy has kept you bound by, uh, by so, for so long that you can become bond servants of the Lord. He has provided restoration and salvation so that you can become more like Yeshua, so that you can emulate the shlichim, the emissaries, uh, so that you can walk out your discipleship to Yeshua faithfully. He has made freedom freely available so that you would share that freedom with the world around you, making Talmudim, making disciples of all nations. Are you truly walking in the freedom of Messiah? If not, what's holding you back? Or what are you clinging to that the Lord wants to free you from? Is your identity still wrapped up in being a slave to sin and death? A slave to this world? Or have you truly found new identity as a servant of Yeshua HaMashiach? I'd like to ask our worship team to make their way back up to the stage. Paul reminds us that the choice is ours. Who are we going to choose to serve? To whom are we going to be enslaved? Romans 6, 16 through 18 says, Do you not know that to whatever you yield yourselves as slaves for obedience, you are slaves to what you obey, whether to sin resulting in death or to obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching under which you were placed. And after you were set free from sin, you became enslaved to righteousness. You and I have been bought by the blood of the lamb, redeemed from slavery to sin and death. And in our freedom from sin, we have been made servants of righteousness, servants of Hashem. As Joshua encouraged Israel in Joshua 24, I want to encourage you this, this morning or whatever time it is today. Uh, as Joshua said in, in 24, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing this, Joshua 24, choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will worship, we will serve, and we will cleave to Adonai. Abrahamim, Father of mercies, we worship you, Lord. We thank you for uh, your word. We thank you for the faithfulness of your word. We thank you for your compassion uh, for us. We thank you for your sacrifice and providing your only begotten son that we could be redeemed and restored in you. Father, I thank you that uh, you have provided a means for us to be not only freed from sin, but Father, that we may be restored as sons and daughters of the kingdom most high. Lord, I pray that you will breathe new life into us, that you will open our hearts and our minds, that you will reveal to us any area in our lives in which we are still allowing the enemy to have ground that he does not deserve, ground that you have already redeemed us uh, from. Father, that you will begin to re reveal to us any area in our life where we still need to humble ourselves before the Lord where we still need to find freedom from those things that we think even our, our closest friends and family have no idea about the struggles we're dealing with. 
but Father, that we can recognize that freedom from all struggle, from all despair, from all sin, from all pain, from all anguish is provided in Messiah Yeshua, that we can be redeemed, renewed, and restored, that we can be made new as a servant of the God of all creation, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the one true and only God of Israel through the blood atonement of Messiah Yeshua. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray, and everyone says, Amen and Amen.